Ian, you've spoken about Spike Milligan inventing British comedy. It's quite a statement. Yes, I've probably overdone it, but uh, <laughs> essentially I meant that almost everybody in British comedy since he put on the goons on radio has acknowledged a debt to him. And up to that point, I mean, it was, it was very much music hall and variety. And then Spike appeared and it was anarchy, it was surreal, and it was um, narrative. It had parody in it, it had stories. It was a completely different beast. And I think that's what we wanted to, to celebrate, to say he invented this way of doing it in this medium. And, and that's particularly true in radio. And is it something, Nick, that will transfer to modern audiences, do you think? Well, I think it will. I mean, we're, we've been very lucky that um, uh, uh, even our children who knew, <laughs> didn't know Spike before we did the play absolutely loved it. You know, we've, we've, we've had uh, younger audiences come in and um, the best endorsement we've had was from a, from a dad, complete stranger, who tweeted after a show at, uh, at the Watermill in Newbury, said... Uh, I did something right last night. My 15-year-old came to see Spike. He said he could see it every day of the week from now on forever. So we feel we, our, our work hasn't, isn't quite done, but, <laughs> but we're very pleased with the response. And how would you describe Spike Milligan's humour to somebody who hasn't seen it? Oh, well, um, it is very anarchic um, and very surreal. Um, there's, there are elements of silliness, um, but, uh, I mean, the, one of the things that we... we really enjoyed you know, developing and exploring with the play is how um, subversive and um, satirical it is. Uh, you know, we didn't realise, and I was a big Goon fan being brought up in the 1960s on Goon Show Records, uh, but we didn't realise until we sort of trolled through the 250 episodes <laughs> that he wrote. I mean, 250 episodes, that's an awful lot of comedy to write. Um, that he was doing, for example, a parody of the coronation a year after the coronation. <laughs> and the BBC uh, hauled him in, in in front of management and said, what are you doing? This is absolutely outrageous. You've got Peter Sellers doing an impression of the Queen. And um, Spike said, no, it's not the Queen, it's the Duchess Boyle de Spudswell. <laughs> and he, they said, no, it's the Queen. He said, no, it isn't. And he didn't try and disguise <laughs> it very hard. <laughs> the chief commentator was called Richard Dingleby. Uh, <laughs> but, you, you know, we think we're in an age of deference and, um, oh, in the old days everyone was very respectful and whatever. It just isn't true. I mean, that was the year after the coronation. And Spike Million was also hauled up by the Beeb for um, being rude about the Prime Minister. Now, the Prime Minister then was Winston Churchill. It wasn't someone who, you know, arrived three weeks ago and you can't remember their name. I mean, this, this was a pretty solid figure. And he said, you know, this is what we're here for. And it was, it was that that was so appealing. And of course, that, that humour came from sometimes a dark place. He'd served in the, in the Second World War. He had mental health issues, which yeah. were well publicised. Is that, is that what he drew his humour from? Yes, I think both being in the army in which he and Peter Sellers and Harry Seacombe, you know, they were all working-class squaddies who found a way to be funny in the army mm -hmm. against this absurd structure, moved into the BBC, found much the same people in charge and rebelled again. And that was um, the motivation. His own mental health issues, I mean, we, we don't shy away from. No, no, we do. There, there are two major incidents that we cover. Um, but both of them um, are infused with humour. You know, he couldn't help um, making jokes, even though he was in the depths of despair. And that's something that we, we sort of tried to, to get over um, in the... Uh, he, you know, he's just a very funny man. So why no? Why the play no? Well, um, what... Um, we were hoping is that um, this is, it was written, uh, The Goon Show was written in a period of austerity, unpopular government, <laughs> uh, cost of living crisis. We were trying to think of something else. <laughs> no, we, we were very keen post-Covid to, to write a celebratory piece, yeah. something that's genuinely, genuinely. funny yeah. and celebrates a golden moment. And we thought um, this period in the 50s, when they were just springing this glorious... Um, sort of goon mania on people would be a good tonic. Yes, it's, it's a sort of first example of a mania after the, after the Second World War. It's post, first post-war mania. Then came Beatlemania. Mm. And it's hard to understate, you know, the impact that the goons made and the, with their novelty records and, uh, and um, you know, they were appearing on... Uh, one of the problems for the BBC management was that they couldn't really um, 
get rid of Spike because by then the, the royal family themselves were great fans. <laughs> and the heir to the throne was a complete addict. So <laughs> it's difficult to start saying, well, this is very disrespectful. Yeah. Off you go. You, you touched on, on satire. You're both well known for satire. You're from the private eye and um, have I got news for you and, and your, your cartoons. Um, the particular era we're in just now, is it actually hard to satire? <laughs> Um, you have to work harder um, because <laughs> they're trying to do it themselves. Um, but it's it's still perfectly possible. Um, it's, it's a 24-hour job, though. That's the trouble. <laughs> it never stops. I mean, really, for the last two years, it's been uh, it's been exhausting. But um, you know, thanks very much to successive <laughs> prime ministers, they've worked very hard to make our job easier. You, of course, are a cartoonist, and mm. it always seems to me that cartoons just boil things down to the to, to the nub. What is it you look for to make a, a good cartoon? Oh, um, anything that sells to an editor, I think, is, uh, <laughs> is the bottom, bottom line. I was about to say that. <laughs> I think what you need as a cartoonist is a really sympathetic and brilliant editor <laughs> who will spot... Who might that be? Yeah, <laughs> I just, names escape me. And you, of course, uh, have got a reputation as being one of the most sued men in, in British history, <laughs> if, if not the most. <laughs> I'm sure I've lost the record um, very, very happily. Um, there, there, was a, there was a mad period in the 80s and 90s uh, where libel was just like the Wild West. Um, nowadays, it's all privacy and um, confidentiality. So as a journalist, if you try and find out about anything, um, any, any sort of government department that outsources anything, they say, oh, no, 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 that's confidential, that's a private commercial. And you say, well, isn't it our money? And they go, no, no, it's secret. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Um, so we, we, we've come into a new, exciting era. And does that concern you, or do you just see more scope for humour there? Um, well, it concerns me in that it's unjust and unfair, but then, you know, um, you get used to that. <laughs> <laughs> and plenty of cartoons to come, then. I mean, you, you, there's nothing's drying up every day. No, I mean, it's just a sort of continual rolling tableau of folly and um, idiocy. I mean, Spike um, had uh, his worldview was the, ro the, the world was run by idiots. And, you know, nothing in the last few weeks has, has suggests otherwise, to be honest. And your no, focus will be mostly be Westminster, but can you see that across the, the nations of the UK, the same... The world. The, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> really, the same yeah. things to pick up on. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. The most, the most important thing for cartoon is really to have somebody easy to draw. Um, and it was a joy having Boris because I think even... Uh, even you could even draw. I could draw more. <laughs> it was one of the great joys of, of, of um, follow, you know, discovering about Spike. Uh, the more we research, we did. He did quite a few cartoons for Private Eye uh, back in the in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. Uh, he's rather sort of an unsung cartoonist, and he came up with very very funny jokes. And one of the joys as a young cartoonist was that they were very badly drawn, <laughs> and it made you think. It was well, an inspiration. It, it was an inspiration, <laughs> and he, it really doesn't matter how badly you draw if the the joke is good, um, it, will, it will get published. And on that point, one of your previous uh, editors in Private Eye advised you if Spike Milligan sends you anything, print it. Yes, and that was very good advice. Um, <laughs> and because uh, Richard Ingram's he's quite a rigorous editor, and, and uh, his advice was just, no, just put it all in. Um, <laughs> and Spike used to bring up um, Private Eye, the offices, uh, and you knew it was Spike because yeah. he'd pick up the phone and go, bloody BBC! <laughs> <laughs> that was it, that was the introduction. <laughs> His, his war with the BBC was never really over. <laughs> <laughs> and very finally, um, we saw you on Who Do You Think You Are? Uh, and I always remember the final scene was you in the Western Isles of Scotland <laughs> speaking to a Crofter Noog in the Isle of Lewis with horizontal rain. Does, it, does that tartan blood still flow through you? <laughs> yeah, no, it was an extraordinary experience and it, it was fabulous to do it. And I, you know, I, I was looking for my ancestors and, and, and got there and it was pouring with rain and the umbrella went the wrong way. It's a great programme and the only drawback is, is the producer following you around saying, how do you feel? How do you feel? Will you cry? Go on, cry now. Cry. Go on, cry. But I thought my ancestors would prefer me not to cry. Well, you had the, the, the rain streaming down your <laughs> yeah, face. It was hard to tell. <laughs> and so what emotions will people get finally from, from the Spike Milligan? Ooh. All laughter? Uh, we hope that you come out with a very warm glow in your belly because um, it'll save you on your heating bills. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Newman, Ian Hislop, thank you for joining us in Scotland tonight. Thank you.